Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome. I'm just going to give it a moment for everyone to get logged in. As you're joining us, if you want to drop in the chat where you are tuning in from, we always love to see that. Say hello and let us know where you are in the world. I'm just going to give it a minute or two so everyone has a chance to get logged in. Hi from San Francisco. Hi from Green Lake, Seattle. Wonderful. Thanks for joining us. Bridgewater, Massachusetts, Sacramento, California. Wonderful. Excellent. Okay. I think we can go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are here to discuss this beautiful book, Tava by Irina Georgescu. And she is here with Louisa Weiss to have a wonderful conversation about baking. And um, I'm already hungry just thinking about it. So thank you so much everyone for, for being here to tune in. Um, I'm Zoe Friesen. I'm the events manager here at Book Larder. We are a community cookbook store located in Seattle, Washington. We do 100% cookbooks and food writing. Um, and we've been doing a lot more of these virtual events the last few years. Um, we have been able to uh, get our, our in-person event started up again recently, which is fantastic, but we love being able to have these virtual events as well, where we can connect with um, you know, an author and an interviewer that are in a completely different part of the world such a special opportunity. Um, and of course, to have you attend from all over as well. So thanks again for joining us. Um, let's see, I'm just gonna give you a um, few notes before we get started and then I'll turn it over to Irina and Louisa. Um, let's see, the talk will be recorded and it will be posted up on YouTube within the next few days. So if you need to jump off, you can always catch the end or just watch it again or send to a friend. Um, you will get a link to the YouTube um, replay in an email as soon as that gets posted. Um, I do have the live transcript turned on. So if you'd like to turn that on or off, you can do that at the bottom of your screen as well. And let's see, um, Irina and Louisa will chat for about 40 to 45 minutes and then they will leave time for Q&A at the end. So make sure you get all of your questions into that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So Louisa can easily find those questions and we'll make sure that we answer those. Um, Okay, let's see. You can support the talk by purchasing a copy of Tava from Book Larder. We do have book plates on the way from Irina. Um, so those should be here in time for the publication day of Tava, which is next Tuesday. Um, so I will go ahead and put a link um, in the chat so you can find that. And thank you so much to everyone who has done that already. Um, okay, and now without further ado, I will turn it over to Irina and Louisa. Hi everyone, can you see me? Hi. Can you see me? <laughs> I can hi, see Irina. You. Okay, great. No, there was some weird technical stuff happening. So hi, this is so exciting. Um, I absolutely love Tava. Um, I found it absolutely fascinating. And I wanted to start off right away by um, asking you to tell us a little bit what inspired you to write this book. This is your second book. Your first book was published two years ago, two and a half years ago, and is about the food of Carpathia. Um, and what, what was it that inspired you to write this baking book now? Well, hi, Louisa. Uh, thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. Uh, yes, this is my second book. Uh, my first book, Carpathia, is about the food from the heart of Romania. But this is a baking book and baking a dessert book. And what inspired me was the actual rich culture of, of Romanian baking. And you can see it in the book that uh, it's very much about the diversity of our ethnic communities, ethnic groups. And it's from this diversity and from this, um, let's say, exchange of uh, cultural influences that our national cuisine has emerged. 
and also our beautiful baking repertoire because it's it's very rich and it's very diverse. So I decided to write a book to call it Tava. Tava in Romanian means tray, whether it's baking tray or serving tray. So not all the recipes in here are baked in the oven or baked in a tray. That's why Tava as a serving tray is, is very good because you have other desserts in the book that are just um, like um, uh, compotes or uh, parfait, for instance, or confiture, jams, they are served, they can be served on a tray, so not necessarily baked. So that was my, my inspiration. Got it. Um, I, I speak German, obviously, I live in Berlin, and I also speak Italian because my mother's from Rome. And what I loved, one, one of the many things I loved about this book was leafing through it and reading the Romanian um, names for everything. It's, I can hear the, the Roman influence, but then seeing these recipes that are so similar um, in spirit and sometimes just in execution to the classic German baking and classic Austrian baking and all these treasures from the Austro-Hungarian empire, of course, which included Romania back in the, in, or the, what is today Romania. Um, anyway, I love that. I love that mix. Um, something I really didn't know that much about Romania is just how much of a melting pot it is. Um, you write in the book that you decided to narrow down the, the recipes to six cultural communities within Romania. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you chose those six and why you felt like they best represented the foods that you wanted to showcase. Yes, well, in total, we have 18 ethnic groups in Romania wow. that have representation in the government. So that means they are large enough to have a representative or sometimes two. Sometimes they even have a whole party like the Magyar, the Hungarian. But in the book, I only had uh, room in 272 pages to actually talk about uh, six communities. And you are uh, totally right about, first of all, our, um, let's say, Latin influence in the language. We are a Latin country speaking a Latin language. And we are surrounded by Slavic countries and by, uh, well, Hungary, um, Hungary, Hungarian language is a finno ugric uh, language, but it's not Latin. But we are kind of uh, um, a, a country uh, of Latinity, isolated and in the yeah. middle of the Slavic world. So sometimes you can even see it in the recipes. Um, we have Italian words and then we have German words and Slavic words. And that means that we have that cultural influence from every part of, uh, of Europe and Eastern Europe. Uh, for a long, long time, Transylvania was was um, Central European in everything, um, in the, the way the architecture, the buildings, the administration, everything. So uh, it's, it's um, as, you, as you noticed, a, a cultural melting pot. And I decided to talk about uh, the German influences in, in, our, in our cuisine, because I also focused on Transylvania and on the Banat region. Banat is not as known as Transylvania, although it's beautiful. And um, Banat has a lot of um, German settlers. Transylvania has, uh, again, villages of German settlers, but they came to Romania um, on different, um, on, in different centuries. The Saxons in Transylvania came at around the 11th, 13th century. The Swabians in, in the Banat region they came in the 18th century. They both came for different reasons. The Saxons were invited to be here to defend the border of Transylvania, of the Hungarian Empire at that time, from the nomadic groups and tribes crossing the, the mountains, the Carpathian Mountains, into Transylvania. The Swabians, the other German settlers in the Banat region, coming later to Romania, were invited by the Habsburg Empire to come and um, make the region prosperous again. After so many wars and also about uh, after the plague, the region was devastated and there was nobody there to work the land. And the crown wanted the land to be financially viable for the crown, can you imagine? So they invited Swabians from different parts of uh, Germany and Austria 
to settle in in the Banat region, and they all sometimes they settled in the in the, the cities, other times in the villages, and they were all spoke different lang different dialects, different uh, dialects of German, and even today the Swabians in the cities don't really understand the Swabians in the villages. <laughs> so it's just but meanwhile, funny. they've they've really con con contained German, their version of German in these like kind of hermetically sealed communities, which I found so amazing. Like you write about these women that you meet in, in one town who still spoke German more in, I guess, better than they spoke Romanian or Absolutely. it was their main language. This is a phenomenon that you will find all over the country and not necessarily only with the German communities. You will go to the different ethnic groups in their villages and their, their cities and uh, they don't really speak Romanian. <laughs> Uh, they speak German, they speak Czech, Serbian, uh, Armenian, they speak other their own languages, Bulgarian, because we have so many communities. And after the fall of the communist regime, uh, they have been encouraged to actually start to speak their own language again, publicly, to write books, to publish newspapers, to have events of promoting their values, their, their food. Um, and their traditions, their dances and the uh, folk music. So today, all of these are um, in their own language. So if I visit um, a Swabian village during a festival, uh, I wouldn't be able to understand if I don't know German, obviously. So I wouldn't be able to understand uh, the language. So when I decided to talk about the German influence in our cuisine, I had to talk about two groups, the Saxons, and the Swabians, because they are in a way different, different people. And you go to the Saxon villages in Transylvania and you mention certain cakes with buttercream and all sorts, and they all say, no, 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 those are not ours. Those are the Swabians. <laughs> I bet they're really territorial about what's theirs and what's... Absolutely, but also because the Swabians coming later had a more sophisticated cuisine. The Saxons coming in, in the 13th century didn't have a sophisticated cuisine, was also really basic. So today, the Saxons uh, in the Transylvanian villages will, will give you liqueur. Liqueur is a sort of Englisch in, in German as well. So that liqueur was made with the leftover bread on bread days, bread that was stretched really thinly, and they, it was topped with whatever people had around the house sometimes only with egg and butter to make some sort of like a very creamy topping of this bread. Sometimes was with semolina cream and with plums and with um, sour cream. And this liquid was put in the oven after the bread was baked. So the oven was cooler. And so it took longer, around an hour, an hour and a half to bake this and to form a beautiful crust on top, uh, you know, with those patches of exactly they call it like a they it needs to blossom they call it a blossom so if, if you don't have the blossom then it's not a properly kill i know this this it yes right you have okay to have the blossom yes the flower this is how they call it and it's it's so interesting because i um, tested the recipes obviously here um so and I made at some point a liqueur that um, had the bread layer because it's basically a bread. It's not a soft cake or anything. So the bread layer was quite thick because I thought I had quite heavy toppings, you know, the semolina cream, the plums. The... So I baked it quite thick and, and they said, oh, you made a Romanian liqueur. I mean, we don't make it like that. Ours oh. is, a, it's thinner. So I, I went back to the recipe and I, I made a thinner liqueur. You know, because, and it's so interesting because I totally respect that. I mean, when I started the book, I thought, okay, I'm going to put together uh, everything that is specific to these communities. And then I realized, first of all, that I don't need to, to modernize any recipe. They are already modern. They are already simple. I don't have to interfere and intervene in any ways. And on the other hand, um, researching and talking to these people, I realized that they trust me with that recipe and I don't have the right to change that recipe. So especially those recipes that come from these communities 
are made exactly like they make them at home in Romania. And if you travel to Romania, you will have those recipes and you will be uh, served. You, they will prepare this for you in the same way I prepared them in, in the book. I didn't want to offend anybody to say, oh, I'll just dust something or sprinkle something. There is no need. And I wanted to respect the identity of every, every dish. And uh, just to, to show you something about this, the, this is, for instance, in the Transylvanian uh, uh, villages, this is a fortified church of the Saxon, Saxon villages. So when they were invited to settle to Transylvania, they built these fortified churches and villages. So if something happened, the women and the children went to the towers to uh, lock themselves and the men went out to defend. And uh, when there, there was uh, uh, no war, because obviously there wasn't all the time, these towers are used for storing food. So a tower was dedicated to lardo and hams, another tower to prunes and dry fruit. So it was a bit of a village shop because they were only allowed two days a week to go in and cut slices from their own ham or all that. And every house had a stamp and they stamped their, their hams to, to be recognized that is there so nobody else can slice their own ham and so on, you know. So um, it's such a beautiful story of self-sustainability in a way. Always Saxon villages, um, were not on main on the main roads. You had to go and travel to. Even now, you need to go and travel to the Saxon villages. You can't just go through a Saxon village, because there is that's not not their philosophy. And also uh, nowadays uh, they um, started to refurbish the, the Saxon houses, and also the inside, the interior of the Saxon houses. And you have here a, a photograph. I'm, I'm not sure. I hope you can see it. So in the style of the Saxon house, and you can go there and when you visit Transylvania, you can stay in those houses. So they are like B&Bs and the, the, um, the Saxon ladies and the people who uh, manage these houses, they will cook specific dishes that are part of their, of, of their culinary um, uh, you know, repertoire. So- Heritage <laughs> really, because these recipes are old, right? I mean, I think, it's really valuable that you've collected them and kept them as they are because you write about it in the book, this um, quite poignant, that these communities were somewhat devastated after the fall of communism in 1989. And these towns and villages were completely abandoned because the people decided to go back to Germany where they hadn't lived for decades, centuries. Centuries. Centuries, yes. yes. And so it's. I think it must be for a lot of these people, you know, to see their recipes that they've been making for hundreds of years in the same way, all collected in a beautiful place that must be such a valuable artifact for them. It is. And it's also a lot of um, Germans, Swabians, Germans and Germans from Germany go back to these villages on holiday every summer. So ah. that's a connection there. It continues to be. I mean, the moment they were allowed to return, some of them, especially in the Saxon villages, returned and uh, contributed. Um, uh, during the communist regime, towards the end of the communist regime, the dictator Ceausescu had a plan to actually demolish all these villages. He said, oh, what's this, you know, with the houses and everything. So, um, and in other villages as well, but the Saxon villages were uh, first on the list. So luckily the regime fell and he didn't get the chance to do that. But still the houses were uh, not necessarily all in a very good condition. And then the Saxons and the Swabians in the Banat um, uh, responded to a call from Germany to return to the fatherland. This was the, the, the slogan, return to the fatherland. And they all left and went to Germany. And actually, when they got to there, the Swabians, the Germans didn't know why Romanians from Romania spoke German and why they are called Swabians. And the whole communities had to go through a process of explanation and reintegration into their own culture again. You know, it's very odd what. But happened. a culture that was, you know, hundreds of years past. I mean, it's fascinating. I. 
I, I wish there's so many elements in this book where I'm like, can't this be turned into a TV show? Somebody needs to take, you know what I mean? Like there's so many fascinating layers um, going on in this book in addition to the amazing recipes. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, does what what role does baking have for Romanians? I mean, one thing that really stands out to me as you're talking is that it's hard to generalize, right? You can't like Romanians. I'm not sure it has quite the same group effect that like Italians. That, you know what I mean? Um, so, pardon me if this is a generalization, but what what role does baking still play? That and and what role do sweet cakes and 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 bread? What role do they play? in sort of everyday Romanian life? Well, we bake very often. So for instance, we have a, a, a type of dish called placinte, which is uh, usually a flat, flat bread. It comes from a Roman Latin word, placenta, and they took it from the Greeks, placuos, means flat. So for instance, every pie that has a bottom layer and a top layer, but no sides, and the filling in the middle, that's a placinta. This is a Romanian apple pie, for instance. One of the so, most... Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. You continue yeah. talking. I just wanna make one question, Mark, which is that in Austria, crepe are called palatschinken. And yes. I think in Hungary, they're called palatschinka or something Poland. like that. Yes, and yes. Poland as well. So is that the root, the same word or is it, it's the same word. They took it from the Latin word and it means flat. So that's yeah. why, because the crepe is uh, flat. You're right. Uh, okay. In Romania, we actually make a placinta the way it's in the photograph here. And okay. here. You can see the cheese version of the same placinta. Uh, I, I like to say that we make it as the Romans used to make it, because the Romans used to use this dough and layer it and then wrap it in a bigger dough and bake it. As a with cheese and honey, and they call it placinta, and this is how we make it today. So I like to say also simplify because we only use two layers, but uh, it's not the pancake, the the crepe uh, from uh, the Slavic countries from around us. So this is very interesting about Romanian cuisine, and we would bake a placinta if we have a guest arriving. We will say, oh, I make a placinta, if. Even for birthdays, I know people who love placinta for birthdays. Um, we bake a placinta when on a, for a Sunday. Um, it, it's also a snack because we don't serve a placinta with any sauce. Um, it's, and it's always cold. You know, you eat it as uh, cold. Uh, we also put placinta, again, it's flat on the griddle. So we put the filling in the middle and we fold it and we put it on the griddle. In other parts of, the, of uh, Romania, uh, sometimes in Transylvania, you actually fry them instead of griddling them. Um, and also, we also have um, in Moldavia, in the uh, in eastern part of Romania, uh, where um, hemp was to be a, used to be a popular crop, we have on Easter Eve people make balincile dom domnului which means um, the blankets of baby Jesus. And I don't know if you can see here, these are layers of dough and the filling is hemp cream. I added uh, pumpkin seeds to the hemp cream just because otherwise you would have had to use a lot of hemp. Uh, and I don't know if that would have been available. And so what you do, you actually... It's a sort of ancestor of a baklava, basically, because what you do, you actually bake the layers first, you griddle them, and then you soak them in syrup, and then you layer the pie with the cream in between. And after that, you put a heavy pan on top of the pie and leave it for 24 hours to compress and to absorb all that syrup. So it's the other way around of a baklava, because yeah. a baklava the syrup at the end and you bake it with the filling in the middle this one you actually cook the layers first so Pelincile Domnului, Scutecile Domnului, Jesus has 12 blankets obviously 12, 12 months 12 is a important number in religious celebrations 
And also because at Christmas time, you actually want to gather on the table everything that represents um, the uh, like something that you can harvest next year. So if you have uh, wheat or, or maize or hemp or poppy seeds or anything, you want to put them all on the table to actually get the blessing of, ah. of the new year, basically, of the Christmas. And so would this be a typical Christmas dessert? Yes, yes. Only for Christmas. It's only on Christmas Eve, people bake this and they eat it on Christmas Day. And so hemp, I, I don't think I've ever seen hemp in a baking, in a, like a traditional baking format. Um, I don't even know. I mean, I've had hemp seeds in like a smoothie, but I don't know what it tastes like. <laughs> what, you know, what's it? Traditionally, you would boil the seeds and then grind them and then makes it like a, like a paste and then add milk and all that. But I used um, cracked seeds. So sometimes I think they're called hearts, hemp uh -huh. hearts, yeah. something like that. So they are already open. So you don't have to go through the whole process of grinding and boiling and all that. So you can actually uh, make it raw. You don't have to boil it at all. So in my recipe, you just mix them in a food processor and then you keep adding the liquid until it gets to a paste consistency. Mm -hmm. And then it's hard to, to layer it. And it's very interesting because it's also, um, if you think of all the dairy-free today, all the trend of dairy-free cheese or dairy-free cream or dairy-free something, well, hemp is, is, the re is the answer sometimes. The original <laughs> dairy-free. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's just by accident, I, I can tell you that. Just by accident because hemp was popular, uh, crop, po po popular crop, so they wanted to include it in something religious to get yeah. the blessing till next year you have a, be a better harvest, so you have a better year, so... Yeah. Well, hemp isn't the only unusual ingredient um, that I found in this book. There's also, um, you say that fresh ginger was uh, historically used in Romanian baking. So you include it here and there, um, which I thought was interesting. Um, and then you mentioned that Romanians eat quince raw. Is this true? <laughs> <laughs> you need to tell me more. It blew my mind because I don't know of how many of our um, audience has, you know, eaten quince, but I've only ever had it cooked. In fact, I thought it was not possible to eat it raw because it's so hard. Um, and I imagine also quite sour um, because you have to use quite a bit of sugar. So can you tell me a little bit about yeah. how... We love quince. I mean, quince is also, uh, you put it on the windowsill and just gives that aroma into the room. It just, you don't need any other perfume or anything yes. like that. It's such a beautiful, delicate fragrance to have in the autumn. So we actually just put them there. And if you, if you want something like as a snack to eat and you don't really want to open a jar of compote or jam or anything like that, then you get a quince and you slice it and you eat it as it is. And I know First, first slice is quite a shock to the senses and then you get used to it. And then you kind of, I know it's tangy, but not all quinces are the same. Yes. So obviously some of them, uh, even now when I um, buy them in the UK, I don't find them all the time. So when I buy them, sometimes they come all the way from Spain and they don't have the, the flavor and the, the texture of the ones I, I have in Romania. In Romania, they are bigger, and also, um, if you keep them to mature, they get sweeter. They, they are still sour, so don't get me wrong. They, won't, they still have, uh, you have, still get that shock first, but first slice. But then you actually discover all the, all the flavor in the queens. Also the sweetness, the perfume. It's like eating perfume. It's such a good, such a good thing. And um, obviously, it's a, it's a good snack. Uh, when I grew up, during the communist regime, we didn't have crisps, we didn't have chocolate. Chocolate was once a year coming from China, to be honest. We had Chinese chocolate, milk, milk, chocolate, milky chocolate from China. So otherwise, we, we would have had jams and fruit, you know, and quince is a very good fruit. It's an ancient fruit that lasts after harvesting. So you can keep it for months. Um, if it's stored properly. So it's not like a fruit from the supermarket today, you get an apple and in two days it's gone, you know. 
Yeah. So people in those times kind of wanted fruit uh, to last, not necessarily to rot in two days. So quince is perfect for that. And we this this was our snack, eating uh, eating quince and gherkins. Not together, but I'm just saying. Wow. Well, <laughs> so um, can you talk a little bit about how the time under communism affected Romanian Romanian food ways, um, because you write a little bit about how there was this sort of flattening of traditional culture. Um, but I think it's really amazing that after the, after I keep saying after the wall fell, because I'm a Berliner, but of course it wasn't the wall everywhere. But anyway, <laughs> after the wall fell, all these communities kind of were able to, I don't know, regain life again and their traditional foods just kind of pop back up again, which speaks so much to the resilience of, you know, the importance that food and traditional food has in communities that are as vibrant as Romanians uh, food communities are. But I would love to know a little bit more about what was lost and, and, and what survived and why you think certain things survived, but also the people who are today working to be, revive these traditional Romanian foods, like who are they? Are they individual home cooks? Are they food uh, professionals? Are they historians? Like, is it all of them, all of the above? Yes, no, they're just enthusiastic people. Uh, <laughs> yeah, very committed to recovering a, a past that, you know, we almost, almost lost. Uh, well, the communist regime um, kind of, first of all, affected our cooking in any ways, in all the ways, because we didn't have enough ingredients. Uh, you know, we had a, a lot of the time we had um, uh, allocated flour, quantities of flour, oil, eggs, blah, blah. blah. So we didn't really have, uh, especially in the cities. In the countryside, you know, you were allowed to have a hen or a pig or you kind of, you know, but cities were really uh, isolated in a way. Uh, luckily, uh, all of us uh, had a relative in the countryside, so we were able to get some eggs, to get a pig, and, you know, pork and, in December and stuff like that. But so through this, first of all, the first layer, the impact was the fact that we didn't have the ingredients. And in the end, towards the end of the communist regime, we also only have one cookery book, a cookery book that actually started in the 30s when there was a lot of abundance, when Romania was thriving on all levels. And it was such a beautiful, it had a thousand and something recipes in it with wow. all sorts of recipes from the urban bourgeois recipes to the countryside recipes, absolutely beautiful collection, Sandra Marin. And also, uh, in time, they took this book and they started to cut the recipes, first of all, to get rid of those that were a bit too um, noble, too elegant for uh, the proletariat of the, you know, the republic and the communist um, yeah, republic. And then they also started to delete recipes because we couldn't find any of those ingredients. Uh, and we ended up with a lot of vegetarian dishes and stuff because we were actually, we had to queue to get the chicken for hours. Mm -hmm. And the chickens were so small that even for them, for the, for the leaders was a ridiculous uh, creature. So they used to serve, they used to sell two in one packet because they were too small. So can you imagine how, how, do, you, how do you cook? How do you plan your meal? You don't plan, you don't count on chicken anyway. So. So it affected a lot of our recipes. So people who grew up with this book and people who grew up with not knowing what traditional Romanian cuisine is, then the, we only had this book. So this is what we all knew. Obviously we were not allowed to talk about other communities. So Hungarians or there was a no-no everywhere or Armenians or Jewish can you imagine, or, you know, so we were not allowed to talk about their, input into our culture at all so even for them those uh, um, specific dishes were basically kept uh, under the table because they were not allowed themselves to to cook their own dishes and also to celebrate their own festivities or anything like that so publicly so you know so it was quite uh, quite hard then at some point uh, the regime decided 
they needed a lot of uh, foreign currency in the country, obviously, to pay the international the international debt and so on. So national debt. So they started to attract tourists and they put together, and this is not something that happened only in Romania, it happened in all communist countries. Uh, they put together a sort of standard menu to attract these tourists and also name also being very nationalistic in a way and saying Oltenian dish or from Transylvania or also um, Hajduk dish, uh, Hajduk are uh, rebels like Robin Hood. You know, if it was something meaty, you know, something that you can catch in the forest or something that was Hajduk, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so um chobanesque choban is a shepherd so everything that has some cheese on top was chobanesque to, ev to kind of be evocative of the countryside and all that but that menu sadly even today if you go and visit and um, um, eat in a restaurant that menu still exists in romania so you would be mm -hmm. served in a way the same soup in transylvania as in dobroja in southeast of the country in a restaurant um, even today, some of the restaurants started to um, cook their ethnic dishes, because if you are um, in a German community, you have your own dishes and now you are allowed to cook your own dishes. So you go back and find out about those dishes if you don't know, and then you put them on the menu. So that's why in Transylvania, the Saxons will serve you Saxon dishes, because now they are allowed to cook that. But also through the years, because you might imagine after the Second World War, we were more, um, we started to gradually be very nationalistic rather than tolerant. And in 60 years, there are, there are loads of um, transformations. So even the ethnic groups, what we call today minorities, they started to uh, be kind of leveled and take dishes from, like we say today, Romanians and make, make them their own, you know? So sometimes even when you research, you kind of think about where that particular family lived and when they say grandmother, mm -hmm. when what was that grandmother? Because also the, the regime started to look at monocrops. So everything rice, everything wheat, everything sunflower, imported rice, again, a lot of it uh, and not, not grains that would have been traditional per barley and other you know uh, rye and all that mm -hmm. so we lost the dishes and we lost the ingredients through decades um, and today a lot of people will say that it's traditional to use oil which I know is not true because it's traditional right. blood right. not everywhere if you look at the Turkish and Tatar communities they they use oil traditionally that's fine it's fine but um not in Transylvania so you kind of think about and then they say well it's traditional to use rice well it's not traditional to use rice because this was a region of pearl barley it's traditional to use pearl barley but so it's kind of even today what we consider to be traditional I think we need to go back in time quite a lot uh to find those those recipes that are um that they used to be cooked uh in Romania because I can't really say Romanians necessarily because those dishes would have been Hungarian, would have been German, would have been Armenian, and all these nationalities. But together, today, if you travel to Romania, then you will see those differences today. And these differences, as, as you said, uh, kept alive now and rediscovered um, by, uh, by people who are really committed to, to reinstate our, I don't know, to 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 have our to find our dignity basically in in terms of cul culinary dignity in um, in our cuisine, and they cook with seasonal ingredients with local ingredients. They cultivate old ingredients. They go back to what we used to in terms of seeds of flowers of everything. They go back to that. So it's nice when you actually travel as a tourist to go to those producers and actually buy stuff from them to uh, to support that um, microeconomy and climate that they are trying to to put together in a country that economically is not doing really well and from the legislation point of view 
is very up and down. So to be an entrepreneur is very, it's, it's a very brave thing to do. You know, you put yourself on the line there in many, many ways. Interesting. Uh, so that's why in my book, I really want people to go and travel because by traveling and by actually asking to be uh, fed uh, with local traditional dishes and not with pizza and other stuff and, you know, fish and chips, uh, then you will support not only those uh, B&Bs and those villages, but also support the revival of uh, national traditional cuisine. Yes, I mean, and I imagine that only by traveling are you even able to see the Armenian community, the Transylvanian community, the, because they're all they're all cohabitating, but there are so many different influences. I mean, I just think it's it's fascinating the stuff that you write about the Armenian um, influences, both from the flavorings with like rose water and ma mahleb. I think I'm not quite sure you pronounce yeah. that. Yeah, um, but also the coffee um, that this would have been something that the Armenians brought with them, and then of course the filo dough and the baklava and all of that, um, and then that paired with the with the German influences and with the Latin. I mean, it's just. I, I earlier this year I read Black Sea by Caroline Eden. Have you read that book? Yes, yes. Um, that that sort of piqued my interest in Romania because she writes about the part of Romania that's on the Black Sea. But this um, really has opened my eyes to so much more, and it's I, I it makes me want to go to Romania right away. Um, do you recommend places for people to to travel to, and um, do you have like itineraries that you recommend? Yes, well, first of all, I put something at the back of the book with acknowledgements here. You will see everybody who actually, in a way, contributed or helped me when in my research. And especially in the Saxon villages, you will find out the number of the houses where we stayed and where <laughs> we took the, the photographs, because some of the photographs were in those houses. Uh, you will see the name of the, of the hosts so if you go to Sorina, if you go to Denisa, they will actually bake a liquid. They will make you donuts with curd cheese. So you, wow. you will find all, all, this, all this information there. When you go to Sibiu, you will know to go to the Brukenthal Museum. But now you know who Brukenthal was. Yes. He's yeah. the guy who like, loves the jams. You know, the governor of Transylvania wanted to, to count his own jars, you know, himself. Didn't trust anybody else, you know, and... So in such a, it's, it's this, there is a statue of him in front of his museum here. And I managed to find a manuscript of, the, of some of the recipes because again, the communist regime actually burned a lot of the documents in this museum anyway. And I managed to recreate a, a pudding that he liked and also with the gooseberry jam because he loved gooseberry jam. You know, he was such a, such a character. He never drank, he didn't drink alcohol. He preferred fresh water from a stream, um, from a, a forest. Don't we all? <laughs> from the absolute, but it was brought to him every day, you know? <laughs> right. It's like the freshest of the freshest. You know, so. so all these all these stories and, um, and also, you know, in Transylvania, you will also see, uh, you will find the uh, Sekeli communi communities. These were the first Hungarians, basically, because the Hungarians are split between the Sekeli and the Magyars. So the Sekeli actually are the first to, again, arrive to defend the border in the Carpathian Mountains. Um, and uh, you find the whole story about the Sekeli and also the, the gingerbread in, yes. the tulip, in the shape of a tulip. Uh, which also is the shape of the tulip on the on the cover here, just to create the link between the cover and what's going on in the book. Actually, I know. I meant I still have still have so many questions which we haven't even gotten to, um, and I feel like there are questions um, coming in in the Q and A. So I want to talk about two more things. I want to talk about the Sekeli gingerbread because it's fascinating, and I want you to tell us a little bit about this just the beautiful design because it's so unique and it has a wonderful story. So first let's talk about the gingerbread because it's wild. It's very reminiscent of German gingerbread, right? Absolutely. You say it's basically the same thing. Absolutely. But, 
And I, I was counting on it. I was counting on you to recognize the whole story of the gingerbread because you also have a story of the same thing in your baking book. Yeah. And I was thinking, God, this is this is the thing. <laughs> and the reason is, the reason is that all the technique of making gingerbread comes from, from Germany. So centuries ago is a German technique. And even in the Sekeli communities, Hungarian basically, uh, all the utensils and the names of the method and everything were uh, almost German names and German utensils. So they didn't use a, a Hungarian name for everything. So they used the same same German. But secondly, uh, gingerbread is something even now is famous in Romania and everybody wants secondly gingerbread. But they started like gingerbread that was pushed into molds, wooden molds, not necessarily ice like we have it today. So, uh, but that in time uh, transformed and we had cookie cutters and all sorts of things. So now they have this beautiful tulip shape that is traditional and beautiful colors. And initially gingerbread uh, used to be served with meat, you know, not when, when it wasn't iced, obviously. So, and it's possibly one, of, and it's called pogacha in Transylvania. Uh, so honey bread, pogacha is, an, is a Slavic word. So already you see the influences. Slavic uh, in, in Transylvania for a while was uh, what I call lingua franca. So everybody was speaking uh, uh, Slavic because all the tribes were different, but you know they found a way to communicate and they were communicating through Slavic words. So we use, Sekeli use a pogacha, use a Slavic word and uh, a German technique, and they actually make a Sekeli gingerbread. And in time, this gingerbread used to be made only by housewives, uh, by women in the, in, the, in the villages, as a, a way to top up their income. So it wasn't necessarily a, a guild or something organized like it is in Germany. Um, and um, it used to be also made with a sort of, um, uh, I would say, leftover, leftover honey. So the Sekeli were buying the honey. Uh, from the honey makers and also uh, selling the very good quality honey but uh, when they were washing the honeycombs with that water they were making the gingerbread and after everything was washed and clean and everything they were compressing the honeycombs and selling them to the candle makers the wax to make candles mm. so it was a very interesting circle you know in uh, in the autumn when they started to to do this and uh, that's why we have it. We have the gingerbread with with uh, honey, and the most recognizable uh, ingredient in the Sekeli gingerbread is rye, because rye was a, a good crop in that area where the Sekeli have uh, the, their villages. So not necessarily wheat, uh, and also and rye and barley, and that's why uh, villages are also known for their beer instead of for their wine because they had more grain to make beer rather than wine and then you you step outside the Sekeli village and you find yourself in a wine land you know yeah microclimate for them wine wasn't a thing so it's just very very interesting yes very interesting I feel really bad um we have to we have, I have to keep my eye on the watch I mean um tell us Tell us just really quickly about the cover of the oh, book, yes. and then I'm going to go to the Q&A. Okay, so the cover, because I was telling you when we said hello earlier, the cover was actually embroidered by hand, for real, by an embroidery in Australia, because the designer is from Australia, the designer of the cover. So we talked, I talked to the designer, my uh, publisher, about all the traditional elements in traditional um folk costumes or blouses on everything in Romania. So we have we have the sun here with a cross in the middle. This is very Romanian. And we have this kind of small flower here that you can find it in embroidery as well. And also we have the tulip of the Sekeli and all the, the pattern here that's, uh, you know, the symbol of infinity and all this. And then we have some of the ingredients. This, this, this is our addition, basically. We have the apples and the grapes and we have some plums. So after the designer you know, decided to use these elements, 
in order to create the right stitches and to you for you to have the the very very real um uh, view texture. of what stitches are and the texture texture it actually employed a, an embroiderer i don't know how to call it and yeah. she did everything by hand she sent me i put it on my instagram she sent me images from when she was embroidering all these elements so you can see it on a big red you know uh cloth she was just doing all this and after, when she finished, she sent it to the studio and they actually took a very high res image of the real embroidery. And then they actually decided where to emboss all these elements. So it's actually quite a tactile cover. Yes. Go it's and so feel, beautiful. Feel everything. Yes. Yeah. That's well, story, which was incredible. Hats off to the designer and to you because it is, it is exactly as you say, it's tactile. It's beautiful. This is an amazing gift. Like this for Christmas is just the thing to have. It's so, so lovely. It's such a, it's a triumph. It really is. Okay. We're going to go to the Q and A. Um, I'm ready. Um, okay. Oh, here's a great question. Has the Roma population contributed to Romanian food culture? Yes, I mean, even in the Saxon villages, because I, I think the Roma, Roma population was a, a some point villainized by the fact that they moved into empty houses right away, which is not their fault. They, nobody gave them any housing. They, you know, they had quite an interesting um, misunderstood history, I would say, uh, in Eastern Europe in general, not only in Romania. So they moved in. But today they are the ones who actually contribute uh to the uh, revival of these villages uh not all the saxons came back uh from germany so the population is mixed in these villages but they all contribute and they all see that coming together and learning new skills like how to make bricks how to um how to uh fix a roof for instance sympathetically i mean so with the old traditional materials this is a skill for life some of them started uh, family businesses. They can just give to their children. So all sorts of things. So they actually contribute uh, a lot today to keeping these uh, historical villages alive. In, ter in terms of cuisine, absolutely. But when you go and, and chat with them, actually they eat a lot of what the rest of the country eats. They eat zakuska, they eat lamb. Um, roast lamb and stuff like that they also eat a lot of vegetarian dishes and I have to say there is this uh, concept that they like to eat rabbit because you know it's game and it's free and they just catch it in the forest they don't like to eat rabbit they consider it to be vermin and they don't like it so they don't eat rabbit <laughs> okay <laughs> you know so but they still have uh, they, they focus on quite quick dishes I would say in terms of uh uh baking like flatbreads and stuff like that uh so i would say that actually they absorbed a lot uh, from their neighbors wherever they settled because communist regime asked them to settle so they say from now on you can't travel so you settle so that was uh you know absolutely against their nature and they said you settle with i don't give you in the city anything you settle wherever you can but around the city or around the village or around so they were always left on the outside which is our fault as a society in a way anyway that's a long story but i will say that having had to settle against their nature and their wish and everything then they started to um have their traditional food to be actually the, the food of their neighbors because you are there you can see it you know so I think you need to dig very deep, deep to actually find something that came from a Roma community and influenced a lot our our cuisine. Although there is in that menu that I mentioned, the communist regime menu, there is a, a, a savory dish called musculus tiganes, which is um, a loin of pork loin called gypsy pork loin. And because it's so lean and it's, we say that, you know, they work really hard and men were really lean, you know, so uh, loin, uh, you know, very lean. Uh, it's and can you say that, can you say the word, the Romanian name for it again, but slowly? Musculets, tiganesque, because tigan, 
are yes. the Roma people. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. And in Germany, they're called, well, now not anymore, but for a long time there, they were called Sigoina, but that's yes. considered a, a, a not nice term for them anymore no. they just want to be known no. by their Gans, Roma Gans from France you know so the same right. the same word yeah right yeah. right okay so another question is is there something you make that you hold very dear passed down from your elders in the community um and that you wish people who made it would do a better job of interpreting right oh oh hard question I'll answer to the first first one um, because I actually come from, I don't have, uh, uh, my grandmothers were not German or Hungarian or Armenian or anything like that, but still my grand, my grandmother from my mom's side, she was from Transylvania. So from there, we have this love for, um, pastry for pies. And in the book, I have, um, a strudel with pumpkin. This is a strudel. I made the pastry myself here. Because uh, when I used to, and I put some photographs here of making the pastry, because it's not difficult. So just try it and you see, because it's not difficult. But um, at home, we wouldn't go to buy necessarily pastry for strudel. You can go now, but you know, not my grandmother or my mom. So this is something very dear to me. And uh, I know that it's not an invention and it's not something recent. It is a tradition to make seasonal pump so make seasonal strudel with pumpkin because the same strudel you use it to make it with cherries when the cherries are in season otherwise only apples and curd cheese are the most popular fillings and some people say to me is this pumpkin something that is your family's recipe or something and I say no it's not my family's recipe so that's why I wanted to put it in the book as a pumpkin strudel, just to intrigue everyone <laughs> and also to actually put it there in writing and say it is something that families do, not just my grandmother. We do it. Pumpkin pie, plecinta kudovlak, strudel kudovlak, dovlak is pumpkin. This mm -hmm. is traditional Romanian. So I hope I answered your question in a way. <laughs> I think so. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, just uh, we're getting towards the end. Um, can you tell us um, about the meaning that walnuts and hazelnuts have in Romanian culture? Because you mentioned it in the book, but then you didn't go into detail. And I'm very intrigued, um, especially because there are a lot of recipes with walnuts. Um, for those out there who have to avoid gluten. Some of the recipes substitute ground walnuts for flour. Um, and I wanted to know a little bit more about their special meaning. <laughs> yes, well, walnuts are, uh, they, they grow, walnut trees go everywhere in Romania. Uh, you don't have to plant one. There are walnut trees everywhere along the roads or everything. So they are part of our landscape. Uh, and hazelnuts, alune de padure, hazelnuts are uh, as well, but not as um, you know popular as as the walnuts. So, as opposed to almonds and pistachios that you can see if you cross the Danube in the south to go to Bulgaria and to go to the Balkans, you all of the sudden are in the land of pistachios and almonds. We are north of the Danube, so just this huge river created this border, and we are the land of walnuts. So we use them in basically everything. And also because they are so everywhere, they uh, play a role in the festive dishes and also in Lent dishes, because Lent, we have Lent 180 days a year almost in total, which is a lot. So what do wow. you eat? <laughs> <laughs> so um, especially when there are months when there is no fresh produce. So late autumn to late spring you don't have any fresh produce what do you eat so you eat dried fruit and you eat dry nuts dry walnuts dry hazelnuts so they are part of different dishes uh, that are um, to celebrate christmas uh, when funerals you make oliva with pearl barley and walnuts so walnuts are part of everything and also lent for instance when people observe lent then like properly some of them they don't even want to eat oil, even if it's plant-based oil, because they consider it to be fat. So fat mm -hmm. is not part of the Lent. So the only exception 
is a walnut oil. <laughs> so you can ah. eat that, you know. So walnuts, they- It's like they a staple, a staple yeah. ingredient yeah. Yeah. year round. And we also turn them into flour and we put them in cakes. We have the German Ischler, Ischler, Baden Ischler cookies. Yeah. Made with walnuts. And it's such a fragile, I know you recognize it. I'm so happy you agreed. To I did. <laughs> there's so much in common and with your baking book and my baking book there are so many recipes that actually come from the same culture but you can see them in a different light absolutely yes. exactly exactly you know what I kept thinking while I was reading this book um sometimes I don't know if you've ever seen footage from like the turn of the century um, of European immigrants arriving in the United States and you see them in all of their various national dress and it just looks like this sea of humanity, right? And, it, and you really feel like you're looking back at a time that no longer exists. This book brought that to life. I found it so moving um, to really see all of these different cultures alive and thriving through their food in your book so just yeah I just had to mention that because it kept so coming up while I was reading just it just very quickly I need to show you because you said that I need to show you the kurabia Armenian uh kurabie cookies uh which are round and you know I was trying to these ones so when I researched this and talked to the the guy that is has a profile in this book Paula Gopian I kept saying you know Kurabia, you can see them all over Middle Eastern countries, and sometimes they are in the C letter, sometimes they look like an S. I kept saying to him, What can I do with these Kurabia? What, you know? And he said, He said something like, Lady, these are ancient cookies for us. They are round because we used to worship the sun. So you can make them in whatever shape you like, but we make them round. <laughs> wow. That's so I, okay. You know, that is that is something that's the point. Yeah, they're round. That's the point. <laughs> yeah. And this is a celebration of, of tradition. What he said in a few words, what I you know I had to say in a book, in the whole book. <laughs> yeah. yeah, fantastic. Love it. And there's the sun right there, the yes. Romanian sun as well. <laughs> well, with that, I guess we have to say goodbye. This was so great. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. Oh my gosh. Thank you both of you for being here. That was such a fascinating conversation. Um, congratulations, Irina. It is truly a, such a special book. I mean, the amount of history and thought that's gone into it, not to mention, of course, the food that I cannot wait to make. Um, just going to be such a, it's going to be a, a regular on my holiday rotation for sure. So thank you so much, both of you for being here today. And thank you to everyone who tuned in as well. Yes. Thank you to everyone and to both of you. Thank you so much for, for everything. Thank you. See you soon. Have, <laughs> Have a, a great day. night. See you okay. soon. Bye. Take care.